Hello YouTubers, welcome to Big Buddha is Watching, I'm Big Buddha and today I'm looking at what was I guess the return of Red Dwarf after a, a decade long hiatus in the form of Red Dwarf Back to Earth which it to all intents and purposes, this is series nine, really, even though it's the, the technically the shortest series they ever did. Uh, only three episodes, uh, as opposed to the eight they did for seven and eight and the, the standard six that they usually do. This was only three episodes or, I mean, it could even be argued, really, that it's only really one episode. Um, because, uh, I mean, this is the director's cut on it. Um, the direct It does has, have the broadcast episodes on here, but the director's cut is it all, because it's all one story, is the version of it that's all been edited together into to make one story. This is really the, uh, the closest we've ever got, really, to, to the film. And I think that's very appropriate to say because um, the reason for the, the decade-long hiatus was because Doug Naylor was trying to get the film off the ground. Now, I could probably do a whole other video on the, the ill-fated film, the film we never got to see because th there is so much information out there on it. Indeed, uh, there's... Um, a rare commentary from Doug Naylor on Back to Earth and in that he he does go uh, fairly extensive into some of the anecdotes about making the film and why it never got off the ground. Uh, the story about the Duke of Manchester and uh, his funding uh, is, um, is quite funny. Uh, people mistakenly thought because they I'd say this and Back to Earth, I said in the last review that this and, sorry, this and Back in the Red are really the closest we're ever going to get to a film because they feel the most film-like. This more so than Back to Earth, which obviously still has the studio audience there. And this feels very much like a film. Uh, a short film. I mean, it's it's only seventy minutes long, uh, when edited together. Um, uh, this, uh, but I mean, this wasn't story wise. This wasn't actually meant to be the film. I think a lot of people mistakenly thought when when it came along that because they knew that the film was going to happen for. Um, such a, uh, a long amount of time people mistakenly thought that this was the film you know they just did it on tv that's not actually the case uh the the film the, the actual story of the film was going to be something well a I, I believe it was meant to be basically a um uh, something that wouldn't be canonical with the series it was uh, although it was the original cast it, it would be basically a retelling of the events of series one and then uh, an original story they're tacked on to the the end or in the second and third acts and if you want to know what that story would have been then i believe episode six of series 10 the beginning is basically what the the final act of the movie would have been as well as a few other scenes sort of peppered out throughout series 10 um, which I think is one of the reasons why series 10 feels uh, such a rich series because Doug Naylor was really able to when he so when he'd finally resigned himself to the fact that the movie wasn't going to happen then uh, he was able to mine um, you know ten years worth of writing thirty five drafts of the scripts you know in order to because I think. It, <laughs> He was looking at making a sixty million dollar movie, and then that kind of got whittled down in the end to a ten million dollar movie, and even that he he couldn't get made. Uh, you know, in another reality, the film did get get made, and I, this would be the video where I'd be discussing the movie now. Uh, but it was sadly never to be. And in another alternate reality, of course, it was uh, a movie that was scripted by, both by. Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, uh, and directed by Ed By, ideally, who would have had experience in movie directing at, at that point, ha having directed the Kevin and Perry movie, and uh, maybe the <coughs> cough, <laughs> Fat Slags movie, <laughs> his ill-fated second feature. 
Uh, but it, you know, sadly, it, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, it was never to be. Um, I think part of the reason, um, you know, the BBC weren't really behind doing a movie because um, the um, they would have preferred uh, the original script as involved. And Doug Naylor was kind of untested as a director then, you know, despite co-directing credits on series five. He um, he never really. Uh, he didn't really have the directing chops. Now he does, you know, totally. He's done uh, the last four series of Red Dwarf he, he's directed and, you know, he, he's certainly competent behind the camera and uh, I know, I mean, you could argue now that Red Dwarf is, um, has looked the best that, that it's ever looked. But at, at the time he was um, an untested director. Um, so... So it, it was. It was never meant to be, you know. So uh, for for whatever reason, the um, the the BBC decided they didn't want to be in the Red Dwarf business anymore. However, what happened in the interim period between nineteen ninety nine and two thousand and nine was, of course, a little channel, a little uh, groovy little channel coming for you, Murray, called Dave came along which started repeating Red Dwarf and uh, got pretty good, you know, it repeated it a lot because it got good, good viewing figures. Uh, 2009 was also the 21st anniversary of the show and they decided to, that they wanted to uh, mark the, this somehow so, and they wanted to produce some original content. That, that didn't necessarily mean new episodes. Uh, they just wanted to, to do something to celebrate the 21st anniversary. And I know there was, at the time, there was talk of them doing uh, a, just a, a live show with the cast in which the, the cast talked about, uh, you know, did it like a Q&A session, talked about their favourite moments from the series um, and, you know, reenacted some of the famous scenes. It would have been them reenacting the... Uh, uh, Lister and Crichton having sex scene from episode from Polymorph. I'm sure that that would have been in there somewhere, but that didn't happen. Uh, then the idea came along to do new episodes, and um, in a, indeed two new ep episodes. Uh, so, and that th this was um, you know the the first news that I heard of the series was that there were going to be two new episodes after a decade of nothing you know two ne episodes uh great you know that's uh that, that that's well two more than i've had in in the past 10 years so um i was uh, well down for that of course doug naylor's propensity to write 35 minute episodes and now being on a channel that had commercial breaks meant that uh his two episodes when cobbled together basically made up 70 minutes and so instead of uh, editing the story down the two episodes became three episodes so we got a three-parter now that's um that, that's an interesting thing because um the the broadcast episodes of back to earth uh, are the only 23 minute episodes i i.e. they're the only episodes that are in existence that allow for commercial breaks. In From series 10 onwards, when the episodes are broadcast, they actually uh, allotted for a 40-minute runtime so that they could produce episodes that were equal in length to the BBC versions, i.e. ones that were uninterrupted by commercial breaks. Um but, you know, on Dave, they would have to run 10 minutes longer because of the commercials, because of the adverts. So, um, yeah, and Doug Nair said, you know, this is so important in telling a Red Dwarf story because you need he needs the extra five minutes just for exposition purposes usually you know uh, most programs most sitcoms uh you know th there's a shorthand you can do where if you say you do a story p purely as an example um in a, a real world sitcom about somebody contracting malaria you just have to say the word malaria 
and it, there's a shorthand there. Everyone knows what malaria is. You can get on with the story. Whereas in Red Dwarf, you can't have malaria. You have to have some fanciful space disease. Uh, and then you have to spend five minutes explaining what this, the, the space disease does and, you know, its symptoms and uh, how it can be cured. So half an hour is essential, but half an hour broadcast length is essential to set, tell a Red Dwarf story. Um, because you need that extra runtime. So, Don Ellis said, you know, the, the director's cut really is his preferred cut, uh, it is his preferred uh, way to tell a story. He sees Back to Earth as not being a... Um, uh, not not being a, a three-parter, but being one story or, or one episode. And, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, I'd say I, I probably agree, you know, if you were to buy this DVD, what, watch the full length version, you know, which, um, A, you know, it does feel much closer to a movie than we've ever really got before in Red Dwarf. Uh, and B, uh, it just works a lot better when, um, I, they, I think they realised this when they broadcast it because um, they they broadcast it not over three weeks, but they broadcast it over an Easter weekend. So it was over three days. And uh, I think that was really just to keep the momentum of the story going, you know, so you you, you wouldn't tune out. Um, you, you'd know what was coming. Um, so we... Um, so, yeah... 2009 uh, Easter weekend rolls around and we get the first new Red Dwarf that um, we've had. <sighs> so I'm getting a bit flustered now because somebody's trying to phone me, you know, and uh, I don't know why she doesn't realise uh, what I'm doing up to now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let, let's talk about the story, okay. Uh, so I, I forgot to mention, if... if um, but if you want to see my thoughts on M Corp, um, side will just scroll forward to the last five minutes of the video where I'll be talking about M Corp series 12, episode 5. Um, I, I'm not going to fall into the trap of saying this is going to be a short one because I've only got three episodes to, to talk about. But, um, but it might be shorter, you know. I think the the the, the reason the last two videos overrun so much is because I had eight episodes to talk about, you know, which is uh, a lot to get into, uh, even half an hour. Um, so yeah, I'm going I'm going to talk about um, the story as a whole rather than how, how it works as a three parter because it it kind of it does feel incomplete as a three parter. Um, so the basic plot is. Um, uh, so it's set n uh, nine years after the events of series eight. Uh, there's, a, there's a few plot inconsistencies that aren't really addressed, i.e. the cliffhanger ending of series eight. You know, what happened to Rimmer on, uh, um, at the end of series eight? What happened to the rest of the crew? Why they uh, disappeared into the parallel universe? Um, the, why is Rimmer now a hologram again? And um, I, I believe he alludes to episodes that happen in... Well, at least he does in Series 10. He alludes to a, a memories he has of events that happened prior to Series 7, which su would suggest that he isn't the Rimmer from Series 8 at, at all. He's um, the one who left to become Ace Rimmer. Uh, th this has never been addressed, uh, you know, why, uh, why this Rimmer has been back. Um, also, um, Holly, you know, Norman Lovett had decided that he didn't want to do the series anymore at this point. So um, Holly is now um, no longer a main character. They, they sort of, um, they, they allude to this through um, Rimmer t telling an anecdote about um, Lister leaving a bath running, which... Um, Basically, he just fl flooded the whole of the, the ship and um, and killed Holly, essentially. Um, so, so that's where we are. It's really sort of a, a reset to, to go back to the series sort of three to six format of just the, the four main characters. Oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot to mention, of course, the, the um, big reveal is that Kachansky has apparently died um, between series 
uh, between series eight and back to earth uh, but I'll go into spoiler territory now transpires in the end she hasn't she just upped and left Lister and uh, Crichton didn't want um, he, Lister's feelings to be crushed so he lied about her dying so we have the the original um, setup of the series the four guys on the ship uh, when the the series the, when Back to Earth begins, and the basic plot of the episode is that a, um, a another hard light hologram turns up on the ship after an encounter with a, a squid, uh, played by Sophie Win Winkleman. She plays Kremlin Kate. Uh, so she's probably most famous for playing Big Sue's in Peep Show. She. Um, uh, has figured out a way for Lister to get back to Earth. She, she opens up in a, a dimension tear uh, and the Dwarfers get sucked through and wind up in early 20th century Earth in a department store, a department store full of TVs that are playing adverts for the return of Red Dwarf. So they've essentially come out into our world and uh, they, <clears throat> and it's a fourth wall story. It's a breaking of the fourth wall story. It's about the, the characters discovering that they're really characters in a TV show, uh, and uh, how they cope with that. And also, mixed into the fold, there's uh, 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 allusions to Blade Runner. So it sort of starts off set, set in our world, but as the story progresses, it becomes more and more weird as you go into this sort of full-on Blade Runner parody, parody. They go and meet their creator, um, who isn't Doug Naylor. He's uh, basically Tyrell from Blade Runner. Uh, and you... I, I guess, it, um, you know, at the time, we didn't know that Series 10 was going to happen. So uh, Doug Naylor really has um, fun playing with the fact that this could be the final episode, you know, because um, there is um, a strong sense that the, the characters are all going to meet their demise, you know, the, the creators decided to uh, stop writing Red Dwarf, so they're all going to... Um, essentially die and you know there's a there is there is a scene of them getting gunned down in a parody of the glass glass shattering scene in blade runner so um but you know in typical red dwarf fashion you know nothing is is as it seems um yeah <laughs> i'll i'll leave you to watch the episode to um to to figure it all out now if this um all sounds a bit familiar um it's maybe because you've seen the league of gentlemen movie which came out in 2005 uh which basically had exactly the same plot i know that doug naylor has dismissed this accusation that he was just doing what the league of gentlemen had done but you can't deny that the similarities are there. It's basically the same story. Characters from a sitcom um, come to our world to find their creators, um, to, to beg for more life. And there's even some... They even do exactly the same scene in both The League of Gentlemen's Apocalypse and Back to Earth. There's even a scene where uh, the characters are pitching the ideas for spin-off series or ideas for how the show can carry on to the creators uh, but, be but because but because they're only stupid sitcom characters that you know the the ideas are kind of naff you know spin-off sitcom set in a a biscuit factory you know we all go on holiday together um we we end up in the past and I have to save Lister ends up and Crichton end up in the past and Lister has to save Crichton every week. The, the similarities are there. Doug Naylor has insisted that um, he didn't take inspiration from the League of Gentlemen. You know, he, he says you know, fourth wall stories have been going since the ninth century. You know, Arabian Nights did fourth wall stories. Um, you know, um, I think six characters in search of an author 
Perindillo, Perindillo. No, uh, oh, I should have Googled that before I started this one. Um, there you go. There's a tradition of fourth wall stories, and he he, he thought um, that uh, ha having the characters to show up in our world would um, be as fun as them landing on an alien planet. Uh, and it, you know he's kind of right. I mean, this this does feel like a, a genuine red dwarf episode um a genuine plot you know it's it, it's up there with um you know some of the most fun episodes definitely uh, i'll give it that um interesting to know it was um it was the first time they shot on digital video they shot it on the red one so it's it's the best the series has, that has ever looked um for which I guess is another reason why people assume that this was meant to be the movie. Um, for economy reasons, I thought this was an intentional um, thing they did. This is um, well, apart from series seven, this is like the only time they've never had a studio audience. But this is the the only time they've ever had a laugh. They've never had a laughter track as well as never having an audience. Um, so the um, so, uh, so I guess I guess that's another reason why people assume that this is the the movie that ne that never was. Um, you and you get some really fun scenes, you know. Obviously, um, them discovering that uh, their characters in the sitcom um, it was a fun scene and looking out over the the DVDs in the DVD shop and looking at you know basically the same DVDs that I've been showing you and then they find this and what what's fun about this is this is uh, within the show this is exactly how the DVD looks um so you know the, I, I was delighted when the um this was how the DVD that you could buy came out because this is essentially a, a collector's item and even um you know even within the show they actually read out the the blurb on the back you know the um which is exactly the same as uh, as it's well <laughs> I, I looked over as lister was reading it there's, there's a few inconsistencies here and there but essentially it's the same blurb as that lister reads on the back so um i love the fact that although this doesn't it's sort of inconsistent with the look of the rest of the dvds um it's um it's right that um the dvd should look like this um as well um so yeah so great fun moments there's a um a, a really fun moment uh, in a where they go and meet um a, a nerdy type who works in um a shop um a, a comic book shop you know and it's full of red dwarf memorabilia uh allusions to blade runner with as i said before the tyrell scene and the uh they go and see the eye guy but in this he's a guy who makes prosthetic noses um my favorite scene in the whole thing they do a, a parody of the uh, uh crop you know pan left pan right when he's a uh, investigating the photograph in blade runner they do that but they take it to a logical conclusion whereas in Blade Runner he, he finds something in a reflection in a mirror in a photo in this I think they go back and forth about four times you know uh, into the reflection in Rimmer's H and then into um, a drop of water and then back back across the street and uh, a really fun scene um, and uh, of course Craig Charles was in Coronation Street at the time and so uh, they go and find Craig Charles and you get a, a scene um, on Coronation Street um, doesn't make any logical sense oh yes uh, they also get the heart there's no star bug in this but there is car bug and um, the crew um, you know, get to drive a car that's made up to look like Starbug that uh, they borrow from a fan so lots and lots of fun moments people I think th saw them going on onto Coronation Street as jumping jumping the shark but at least it made uh, logical sense within the story you know they, they wanted to go and find Craig Charles well of course that's where he'd be beyond the set of Coronation Street um doesn't quite uh, anyone who's been on the Granada tours thing um knows it doesn't make any logical sense that um, they'd be able to uh, drive onto the set of Coronation Street. 
um, because you know it, it's a closed set, you know. Um, but but they there you go, you know. It's I I still think it's a fun scene, uh, you know. And overall, it's a it's a pretty fun episode, you know. I think um, it's not perfect, you know. Um, there are flaws in there, but I think I I place this. Uh, above my, uh, I think this is better than series seven and eight. Definitely, you know, I think um, this and series ten are some of the best solo writing that that Rob uh, that Doug Naylor's ever done. Um, it does. It kind of loses steam towards the end as the revelations come, but um, about um, Kachansky and. Um, uh, you know, and and the the reuse of the distant bear squid. You know, sadly, Dunnail lapses into the recycling of old ideas again. Um, then, uh, th then it does sort of um, it runs out, runs out of steam a bit towards the end. Although there, there are some funny moments with Lister and the typewriter controlling the world. But then it doesn't make any sense that it, you know if it's a an illusion then how how was he able to use the typewriter to control the world and why was Rimmer smashing his crotch into the the side of the desk um i think i think Doug Naylor sort of wrote, wrote this in a hurry and um uh, for the most part he got away with it but um yeah toward, towards the end it, it does kind of it was kind of one draft away from being perfect, if you ask me. <laughs> so there you go. So that's uh, that's my thoughts on Back to Earth. I'll just quickly talk about M Corp, which is what I watched last night. Um, made these notes uh, very late at night after watching it, um, after falling asleep. So uh, let's just see. I can't really remember what I wrote because it was literally like five seconds before I, I dropped off. So um, this will be interesting. What, what did I put? Um, imaginative plot. So the the plot is um, M Corp is, or M Corp is um, an organisation that took over Earth and they they started uh, selling everything you know water air, um, you know time friends you know anything they could. They now took over the ship um, and they put a perception filter on Lister. If, um, so he can't see anything that isn't M Corp related. So you know his uh, his cutlery disappears, his bed disappears. It's kind of invisible to him, and of course the crew disappear. Um, and then he he get uh, the latter half part of the episode. He, he gets transported to the M Corp base and um, and starts trading uh, time for for all the things that he wants, um, and the. And this this leads to some interesting moments with the uh, the rest of the crew who um, who can still see him but he can't see them, sort of uh, uh, trying to rescue him basically from M Corps grass. Um, so what have I put? The perception filter was used in Doctor Who. However, Russell T Davis stole it from. Oh, I put Doctor Who, but I meant. The, he stole, yeah. The, so the perception filter thing, where you you can't uh, see stuff, was um, I th was used in Doctor Who. In um, the the episode where uh, the Doctor um, discovers that uh, goes back to Earth and discovers that Saxon is the master. Um, and that's how they go unnoticed him and Martha and Captain Jack. However, I know for a fact that. Um, I don't know for a fact, but when I, I was, saw that, I remember thinking, well, that's just the somebody else's problem field from uh, Doug, Douglas Adams' Life, the Universe and everything. So, um, but I, you know, as I've said before, uh, Dwarf and Hitchhikers are my two favourite science fiction things. So uh, I like it when it's... Although, although Doug Naylor now has stopped recycling his own ideas and Rob Grant's ideas and has started... Uh, recycling other people's ideas and uh, now um I, I don't mind when he's stealing from the best you know he's stealing from douglas adams uh, and so my two favorite things are kind of coming full cycle there um i say he's stealing from other pe people now because um life as currency is used from it is of course from in time um the uh I think it's the Justin Timberlake film. Uh, but here it's used in this. 
Um, the beer gag is probably the funniest bit. You know, it's my funniest. It, it, it didn't have as many big belly laughs for me this episode, but uh, I did like the bit where a cat shakes the invisible beer can and explode, and it explodes in uh, Lister's face. I mean, you can clearly see it shooting out of um, his wrist. Um, there you go. Um, this, unlike um, like last week's episode, Macrocracy, this ends with another fan service bit. It ends with Lister basically having his his memory wiped and reverting back to his 23-year-old self. It's his 23-year-old self, not his 25-year-old self. Um, I know because I know he was in real life. He was 23 when he made the first series. He he said he was 25 in in series one. So uh, I don't know if, if this was an error on or uh, Dungley trying to correct his part, uh, correct things uh, on his part. But there's there's a he may have turned 50 at the start of this episode. Um, but whatever you know, it was fun to see Lister. But, uh, back in his old uniform with the, the cigarette in the ear. Um, it was another fan service ending like uh, The Return of Talkie Toaster last week. Um, and I think this is worth pointing out because I strongly suspect that next week's episode, Skipper, is going to be one long fan service episode. But hey, you know, as a fan, I'm down with that, even if the, the, the casual Red Dwarf audience isn't. Um... Not bad. That's my sum up of MCOR. Not bad. So there you go, folks. That's just my thoughts on Back to Earth and uh, and MCOR. Uh, join me next time for, for my uh, review retrospective on Series 10, Red Dwarf 10. And until then, folks, this is me, Big Buddha, signing off. And I shall see you all out there in YouTube land.